Canada's medium and large size cities share many common problems, infrastructure, community building, and the day to day difficulties of managing growth. Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson knows this all too well, and he is part of a handful of Canadian mayors who are attempting to put their needs on Ottawa's radar. And joining us now for more on all of this, there's Don Iveson, the Mayor of Edmonton, and we are happy to welcome you to TVO. I'm glad to be here. Big fan, actually. Well, Used to watch a lot of TVO when I lived in Toronto. You're very kind to say so. We've had your pal Nahid Denshi on the program a couple of times, so it's about time we had the, uh, the mayor of the capital city of Alberta on as well. You are part of a group of mayors, as we suggested, that's trying to get municipal issues, urban issues, on the federal government's landscape with the election coming up later in October. Um, what's the thinking behind all of this? Well, uh, Mayor Nancy and I are trying to do it in Alberta between the two of us along with uh, other mayors in Alberta, but uh, I think there is an extraordinary group of mayors uh, who have been elected, um, many of whom have been elected just within the last 18 months or so um, from across the country who come together around this thing called the Big City Mayor's Table. It's 22 mayors who uh, collectively, if you counted up all the humans we work for, uh, would add up to um, about two-thirds of the country's population. And so that can be a very powerful group of people one, if people want to work together, and two, if you have people around the table with vision. And um, at various times in the history, we've had that. I think for a few years there, it, uh, it drifted a little bit. But again, with so many new faces around the table, um, and obviously much attention was given as it should have been when we met uh, in the springtime, or uh, sorry, more back in February uh, uh, here in Toronto. It was sort of John Tory's debut. But there were uh, eight other mayors from across southern Ontario and uh, a few other places, the new mayor of Winnipeg, for example, who, who arrived. My point, though, is that uh, you know it's it's like uh, it's like hitting the draft lottery, right? And so uh, uh, those of us who'd been to a couple of meetings and some of the old timers who'd been there for many many years remarked that there really is a new energy in the room and a remarkable de degree of alignment around key priorities. And those priorities are transit, housing, and infrastructure. Well, let's see if this takes some of the wind out of your sails here, because this is what the Canadian Federation of Independent Business had in the National Post recently as an op-ed. Municipalities are now getting a pile of new money to spend on infrastructure. Tens of billions of dollars have been promised over the next 10 years as part of the new Building Canada plan. This looks pretty generous, especially when you consider that transfers from senior levels of government were already at a high water mark of 16 billion a year in 2008, the latest year for which we have data. But municipalities are not saying thank you. They once again have their hands out. Instead of asking for more money, municipalities need to start controlling their spending. What's your take on that? Well, I think you have to back away a little bit and think about where does the money go uh, uh, in this country. And the majority of uh, the money has to go to where the majority of the infrastructure is. 60% or more of the infrastructure in this country is in the charge of local governments. And we have disagreed with the past in, uh, with CFIB about whether we have 6 or 8 or 15 cents of the tax dollar. But even they can't argue that 60 percent of the infrastructure cannot really be sustained with uh, as little money as we have. And so the reason we keep going to the other orders of government who have uh, 92 or 94 cents of your dollars, however, uh, however you slice it, is that we really do need effective partnerships with all three orders of government uh, in order to fund the infrastructure that's needed to sustain growth. And How about your right to levy new taxes? Would you rather have that? Well. It depends. In some communities that makes sense. In my community where we have uh, quite a fractured region with 24 different municipalities, simply giving a new tax tool to the city of Edmonton, that's just one more way for me to price myself out of competition with my neighbors. And so um, again, you've got other orders of government who have not only the majority of the money, but I think our point as municipalities has been all of the other tax tools that other order of governments have are the ones that grow with the economy. Property tax doesn't necessarily grow. We actually have to adjust it annually every year just to deal with inflation. And so well, we get, if we get a new subdivision opening up, you get new tax revenue from it. You now have to provide services and maintain the infrastructure in that subdivision. So in order to actually keep up with all of the other issues, and more to the point, to build um, transformative infrastructure like mass transit uh, uh, or inspiring public spaces, any of the things that we need to build globally competitive cities that can actually attract and retain talent and attract investment, uh, that's going to require more than just the property tax alone. Now, some people argue for new tax tools. I think uh, we, you know, we're good Canadians. Surely we can find a way to share. Well, <clears throat> that was going to be my next question. What would be your, prefer your preferential approach? For example, a few years ago, the city of Toronto decided it wanted to create a vehicle registration tax. Anybody who wanted to own and drive a car in the city had to pay this tax. Rob Ford came in, got rid of it. 
Alternatively, you can continue to go to senior levels of government, as the CFIB says, with handout and hope that they are having a good day and decide to pass it over to you. What's a better way to do things? Well, one of the things that we've done in Edmonton that other communities in the country haven't done as much of is shift the cost of our utilities, for example, onto uh, our utility rates. And so a lot of communities across this country um, subsidize their wastewater treatment systems, for example. So they may not even charge a fee for wastewater treatment. It may be embedded in your property taxes. Uh, when you move to a utility pricing model, which we've done, you have the opportunity, uh, first of all, to uh, demonstrate to your customers, your rate payers, what the cost of doing business is for them. Uh, and you can even introduce pricing that encourages uh, conservation, for example. So, uh, you know, Calgary didn't have water meters for most of the 100 years of its waterworks. Edmonton had water meters for most of the 100 years of our waterworks. The consequence of that is that because Edmontonians are aware of their consumption and pay based on their consumption, our consumption is uh, just a little over half of what the average consumption is for a Calgarian household. The two cities are otherwise quite similar. And so, um, so taking a utility model uh, um, in terms of pricing and financing is one way that cities can, within the toolkit that we have, allocate costs a little more more equitably. Now the other thing that a lot of cities do is that if they don't charge it on utilities and they also have cut their taxes or, or won't actually cover the cost that way, what they have and what, what I have an issue with is uh, they have underfunded infrastructure that they're then asking someone else to come and fund with uh, general tax dollars from income taxes or corporate taxes. I would like those dollars from other orders of government to really be going into the transformative projects like things like mass transit projects which municipalities on their own simply couldn't afford and I think the basic infrastructure with the right tools we can look after. You have, if I have this right, a city charter with the province of Alberta which is an arrangement I don't think I understand. What is that? Well, we have a framework for a city charter. We, we're far from having city charters for Edmonton and Calgary yet, but the, the analogy might be something like the Toronto Act, which is the very piece of legislation which provided Toronto with a number of new uh, revenue tools, for example. Taxing and powers. Can we, can we speak English here? Taxing well, powers. Sure, Everybody sure. Everybody wants to call them revenue tools and right that's, now. And that's, that's not necessarily yeah. what I'm after. Uh, okay. What I'm after is, uh, in Edmonton, is a m more mature relationship with, with our provincial government with clear delineation of roles and responsibilities. So, uh, so to give you one example, um, we have, like many other major Canadian cities, a significant homeless problem. Now, we've made some really good progress. We've housed 3,000 people. During that same period of time, another 2,000 people became homeless. The city of Edmonton is not causing homelessness, and yet here we are picking up after it. Uh, and not only with programs to try to house people, but uh, it creates a lot of social disorder, which impacts our businesses at the street level, and it also drives a lot of cost for policing. Now, I also know that it drives a lot of cost in the justice system from the courts uh, to, uh, through to jails because of the effect of criminalization of poverty and homelessness. And then in turn, uh, people who are homeless and people who are in deep poverty tend to interact an awful lot more with the healthcare system, mm -hmm. even using it as a shelter sometimes. And so this is an example where I think there's an opportunity for us to more closely align with the provincial government on prevention programs that not only are gonna make life better in my community for vulnerable people, but it's also gonna cut down on their interactions with the police and in turn with the provincial agencies which are costing us all a ton of money. So what I'm what I'm after is actually partnerships for more efficient delivery of public policy outcomes that are actually going to save money and, by the way, help those people get off the street. The conventional wisdom in this province is that the mayor of Edmonton and the mayor of Calgary can't stand each other because, of course, you're the Oilers, he's the Flames, you're the Eskimos, uh, he's the Stampeders, uh, you're the political capital, they're the business capital. And then I see this picture. You want to put this up? You can see it. You guys, you and Nahid Nenshi look like you're just getting on like a house on fire here. What's the story? And, and <laughs> that's his chief of staff, I guess, who says... Who took the picture, Who yeah. took the picture and says, bromance. Yeah. Um, are you two guys getting along too well for two mayors who are supposed to be in competition with each other? Well, I think the, the thing that's changed is, one, um, Mayor Nenshi and I, or Nahid as I know him, we've known each other since before either of us was elected. So we had some mutual friends that introduced us back in about 2006. And that was after he'd unsuccessfully run for city council and just before I successfully ran for city council in Edmonton. So not that it's a friendly competition, but um, 
But anyway, um, we, we both share a passion for, uh, for cities and what local government can do. And the thing we also have in common actually goes back to about 2002. There was a public policy organization called Canada 25 that did a few years of symposiums around the country on public policy mm -hmm. questions. And they were sort of ex-student leaders who liked hanging out across the country with each other and wanted to continue to get together. And so in 2001, it was the brain drain. 2002, it was because as they studied the brain drain, they said, wait a second, we need our cities to be competitive in order to uh, keep people in this country. Mm -hmm. So the attraction and retention of talent. So, and then 2002, how do we build great Canadian cities? So the guy who authored the report at the end of that process was Nahid Nenshi. Mm -hmm. And so I was involved a little bit in the Edmonton uh, workshopping of all of that. But my point is that going back to 2002, both of us, uh, and for me it was at one of these sessions, really germinated an interest in cities and city building and how important it is to support great nation building as well, that we have competitive, uh, well-run, uh, uh, vibrant local governments. But I'll and pick so up on that word competitive. Why aren't your two cities more competitive with each other? You two seem to be working in tandem to get things done for cities as opposed to in the way it used to be. If Edmonton gains, it's at Calgary's expense and vice versa and therefore we really can't be allies on anything. What's happened to make that change? Well, I think, uh, you know, on the playing field and certainly on uh, on the NHL ice, um, there's still friendly rivalry, as there should be. Not but that friendly, actually, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd actually have to make the playoffs, and, <laughs> and maybe next year we will with Connor McDavid. But uh, um, the the thing is that, that I think we figured out is that, um, you know, Edmonton and Calgary are going to sink or swim together. Uh, we are, you know, good policy for infrastructure and municipalities um, can't just apply to one city. And frankly, it can't just apply to our cities. It's got to apply to Red Deer and Lethbridge and Grand Prairie. And the reason why this is so critical for Alberta is that Alberta is actually the most urbanized province in the country. Most people don't realize that, but 87% of Albertans live in an urban community. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, there's this massive urbanizing trend into both Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, they've been the fastest growing cities in the country between the two of us on and off for several years now. And so, um, you know, competing against each other is, is, uh, is not additive, whereas working together is a real opportunity. And we happen to get along, and we happen to see a lot of the same opportunities for city building. Is there something, because, you know, there are obviously many um large cities in the province of Ontario that may have something to learn from your particular experience. Talk about one thing that Edmonton learned that was a good tough lesson that other municipalities could learn from as well. Well, I, I remember the, the garbage debates here in Toronto and we went through all of that ourselves actually back in the 80s when I was, uh, when I was in school. And, um, you know, it was the landfill crisis, we called it. And we said, where are we going to bury our garbage next? Uh, because our, our municipal landfill was filling up. And so this is an example of a city hitting a hard limit and we could have just paid even more money to truck it even further, which is what more and more cities are, are doing, or we could get creative. And so one of the things that I'm really proud of that we've done in Edmonton um, you know, over really 30 years is take a really transformative approach to waste management. And so uh, we are, with the activation of uh, a, a, essentially a garbage refinery is kind of what it looks like, mm. we're going to be able to get to 90% diversion of municipal waste from landfill. So a very, very little bit will still need to be buried somewhere. But uh, between recycling and composting and now uh, creating biofuel out of what you can't compost and recycle, we, we're actually leading the world, arguably, in uh, handling municipal solid waste. And so it's just, uh, you know, sometimes people give Alberta a hard time uh, around environmental stewardship, but I think this is actually a great example of how, at least in Edmonton, we've seen what was something we were throwing out now as a resource, and actually we're building a company uh, to export our, our expertise in waste management to the world, and we're closing our first deal in China even as we speak. Hmm. Not too long ago, we took this program on the road to northwestern Ontario, uh, Thunder Bay, a northern city like Edmonton, and we talked about something that is um, a state of ongoing concern and uh, heartbreak for a lot of people, uh, Aboriginal relationships. And uh, I want to play a little clip from somebody who was in the audience that day, and then we'll talk about Edmonton's experience with this as well, okay? Let's roll that, please. Regarding racism, racism is rampant in Thunder Bay. It's very, very healthy. Um, when I was younger, it wasn't, it was always there, of course, but uh, because maybe the Fort William First Nation kind of stuck to themselves over there, and they came out once in a while to West Fort and so forth, it wasn't so bad. But now we have a lot of Native people in Thunder Bay, and, and uh, you know, when you go to the store, they know you're Indian, 
and they, you certainly get the diff different treatment. But you know what, I'm used to it. I really don't give a damn. What's happening on this issue in Edmonton that perhaps, again, we could learn something from here in the province of Ontario in terms of ameliorating relations between Aboriginal Canadians and everybody else? Well, we were very fortunate last year to host the seventh and final event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which uh, was looking into the history of what happened in Indian residential schools. And Alberta had the highest number of those schools and has the highest number of survivors. And there are uh, tens of thousands of people in the uh, Edmonton and area who are actual survivors, and then their descendants are intergenerational survivors, survivors of what happened in residential schools. And the trauma that those children suffered and the challenges that they, they live to this day are um, a pressing concern for us. And, and we, uh, we can see a very, very uh, obvious causal link between some of the overrepresentation in poverty, in homelessness, and in victimization. Um, and so what we have is a deep colonial rift that we need to reconcile in this country. And it's not going to happen overnight, but uh, our city took this uh, learning opportunity as, as a transformative one, and we declared a year of reconciliation with uh, Indigenous people what does that in mean? our community. Well, it, it uh, focused us on three main initiatives, and then others spun, spun out of it, but it was really um, a desire to, to repair relationships and honor the, the history of First Nations people, which actually goes back tens of thousands of years in our area. And we think about Edmonton as a place that started in 1795 when Fort Edmonton and the fur trade started. But there's actually thousands of years, really extraordinary uh, Indigenous history there as uh, an intersection of a bunch of traditional Aboriginal trails. And so the archaeological record is fascinating and has artifacts from all across North America in it. So, and some people think that uh, in the oral history that indigenous people actually, as they came through the Siberian land bridge during the Ice Age, actually passed right through and crossed the river right where it is today, hmm. uh, right in Edmonton. And so, uh, so honoring that history and telling a different story, uh, acknowledging Treaty 6, uh, which is the treaty that, uh, that governs the land around our area, I do that at the beginning of every council meeting now. That is a gesture of reconciliation to acknowledge that these treaties are real and binding and have significance to this day. And then we did uh, some specific work around um, creating uh, sites for ceremony to be practiced in the city so that people don't have to leave or go back to a First Nation. They can actually experience Indigenous culture right in the city at some ceremonial sites we're partnering to create. Uh, we've done some workplace education for our staff so that uh, people, especially frontline workers, but also decision makers and senior officials within our organization of 10 or 11,000 staff uh, have more knowledge about historical trauma and, and colonization and its effects on indigenous people and uh, can bring some more compassion rather than stigma to the interactions they may have with people in distress. Let me pick up on that because your hometown newspaper, the Edmonton Journal, had this as an editorial not too long ago in reference to Cindy Gladue, who was a sex worker, mm -hmm. found dead in an Edmonton hotel room. The man accused of killing her was found not guilty and here's the editorial that came out shortly after the trial concluded. The Edmonton Journal says, to many, Gladue's death is just another chapter in a long dehumanizing narrative, a story that predates abuse written Indian residential schools and continues to this day. They may be tempted to despair that there's no truth to reconciliation, or that truth itself might be just an illusion. But a single verdict must not stand alone. A year after Edmonton listened to the horrible stories told at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings, it's important to know horrible stories still happen. Uh, which I guess raises the question for me, how far can, I mean, you're very well-intentioned efforts around truth and reconciliation, how far down that road can that really take you? Well, I think that there are some great opportunities beyond simply building relationships, but in Indigenous culture, building relationships and establishing trust and taking responsibility are, are a precedent to doing anything else. So where I think that reconciliation can take us over time is into some creative approaches to economic development with neighboring First Nations. Uh, they have something called treaty land entitlement, and then there's also some provisions, and we've seen examples in Saskatchewan and Manitoba with the establishment of urban reserves, which are sort of like uh, free trade zones, actually. And I don't think anyone's really thought about how that could be used as a unique economic development competitive advantage. So I think that that's an example. I think I th London, Ontario's got one, too. Anyway. I, there, there, there are a number around the country, and it's something that I'm very interested in. Our uh, Economic Development Authority is taking a serious look at it. I've discussed it with a number of chiefs. And so I think economic development is one tangible thing that can, uh, 
uh, be mutually beneficial and can also ensure then that the, first, the benefiting First Nations not only create jobs for their members, but also have dividends to take home to support education, wastewater, housing. The same uh, local service provision issues that we have in the cities, you know, the, the chiefs on the reserves have a lot of the same responsibilities I have, and that's why we get along well. And I can see that if they can get the resources they need, and those resources should come from Ottawa, but if they're not going to, and if Ottawa is not going to live up to what the treaties say they should, in spite of what the courts say, then I think we can get creative around economic development as one, one tangible opportunity that will make life better on reserves for Indigenous people and band members, and then they will in turn call forth less upon services in the city or come to the city uh, in a better position to participate in community life. Okay. Uh, this is a bit of an odd question, but you've had it before many times, so I'm going to ask it again because uh, people in Ontario may not know you. How old were you when you first got elected? Well, first got elected to City, to Council, City Council at 28. At 28. And, uh, and how old are you now? I'm 35. You're 35. You are, you are clearly the youngest big city mayor in the country. Yes. Um, I presume you want to have this job for more than just one term. <laughs> so what kind of a mark do you want to leave on this job and this city, uh, the capital city of Alberta, by the time you're done? Well, I like to say that I'm on the Freedom 42 plan, so my current intention is to run, run again. And... Uh, uh, what I'm aiming to do is create a more uplifting and inclusive city, so address some of these issues of poverty and homelessness and income inequality uh, and the marginalization of Indigenous people, and there are some issues that some of our newcomer communities face as well. And I, I'm realistic, I'm not going to solve all of that single-handedly, but positive momentum there uh, is really, you know, that's an intergenerational gift. If we can fix some of these things now and, and really invest in prevention, get our provincial and federal partners to actually work with us on the ground, to improve people's lives, that's going to make life better for my kids too. So uh, that's what I think we're going to be judged on um, is, is fuller inclusion for, for all people in, in one of the wealthiest cities in the country, but it could be, that could be shared more, uh, more people could be included in that. So that's one. Another is uh, some work we're doing around energy and the environment, so reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and diversifying our source of energy so that we can improve air quality, uh, save money, and do our part around climate change. And then uh, in terms of changing the urban form of the city, uh, some of the work that we're doing around uh, the expansion of mass transit, uh, densification of the city into a more walkable, uh, I call it the urban shift in Edmonton, you know, uh, setting that more firmly in motion. Those are some of the kinds of things. And, and we're starting to see a lot of great results. We're seeing a downtown that's coming alive, a cultural scene that's always been vibrant but is getting even stronger. And, uh, and then I, I really do think that there's an opportunity to work with First Nations uh, uh, people living in our city and the treaty organizations and First Nations organizations around our city to show what uh, a Canadian city that really lives and breathes the treaty spirit mm -hmm. could mean. You know, when I was your age, you know what we used to call Edmonton? We used to call it the city of champions because the Oilers <laughs> were winning everything, the Eskimos were winning everything, they were really doing well. And for the last many years, as hard as this is to imagine, your team has sucked worse than the Maple Leafs, which is hard to do. <laughs> Uh, having said that, you mentioned earlier you got Connor McDavid, who's the next uh, great phenom to come out of junior hockey. What, what, uh, what has his being drafted by the Edmonton Oilers actually uh, done to the spirits of the city of Edmonton? Well, I can tell you that uh, on draft night or draft lottery night, the, I, the city was just beside itself with excitement. And a lot of things are coming together at the same time. And, and so I like to say it's been a, a rebuilding decade for the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> Rebe a rebuilding a decade. A rebuilding decade because it's been uh, nine That's years funny. out of the playoffs. But, um, you know, that they've done some major reorganizations uh, on the business side of things in terms of decision making. Uh, they've got Connor McDavid as this amazing prospect. And they've got a great team with uh, a lot of the right co competencies covered off. They just need to figure out how to win. And maybe before they do that, they still have to figure out how to lose and not let it drag them down. But, um, uh, you know, one of these years, one of these years, um, and hopefully by, uh, by next fall, actually, when we open up our new downtown arena, which is going to be a spectacular new addition to the city and a real driver of traffic into the heart of our community, uh, that that venue will be the place where we can celebrate and lift the, lift the cup once again. You know how many years we've been saying one of these years in Toronto? I know. About yeah. 48, I think. But yeah. anyway, um, Mr. Mayor, I know you're a Star Trek fan, so let's just finish off by saying live long and prosper. And thank you very much for coming to TVO tonight. And uh, it's good to meet you. Thanks so much. Peace and long life. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. 
Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.